This video is brought to you by BTI Institute, a New Jersey leader in certification-based management training. I would like to welcome you to tonight's uh, Agile discussion group, where we're going to be talking about working agreements. And, and you guys are really in for a treat. Uh, we have two really great Agile coaches that I've been very fortunate to be working with for almost two years now, uh, where I am. And uh, their names are Brock Argue and Urkan Kadir. And I'm, I'm not gonna really go through their, their uh, credentials, but they actually rep represent, they, they're co-owners, I guess, of the Superheroes Academy. And it's a great coaching organization, a lot of training. And I work with them uh, almost on a daily basis. So they, we're really in for a treat. And so with that, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Urkan, who I believe will be uh, doing the actual uh, session. Hey, great. Are you able to see the uh, title screen there? Yes. Okay, awesome. And uh, yeah, so it's actually uh, Brock and I uh, are going to be co-presenting today, uh, and Brock is going to uh, kick us off. Okay, and welcome everyone. It's great to see you all here, and thanks for uh, coming into our session. Uh, really excited to be here with you all. So thanks, Bob and, and team for having us. Um, let's start with a story. Uh, so a few years ago, there were coaches and trainers from Scrum Alliance um, who had the idea of getting together to collaborate on backlog items that were meaningful uh, to ourselves, uh, to the community, and to Scrum Alliance. Um, and this group worked in um, you know, a sprint. And so this was the first of these types of sprints, and it occurred in Vancouver, Canada, where a handful of CECs and CSTs gathered uh, for one week to build something of value. The trainers focused on the path to CSP programs, and the coaches decided to focus on content to support the certified Agile coach programs. Now, this was an all-star team when simply looking at uh, credentials and years of experience. However, we still experience the typical team forming and storming stages uh, as defined by Bruce Tuckman in his model of the stages of group development. Uh, and so the most effective action that uh, we took as a group to help us speed through these stages, because uh, we only had one week, remember, was to create working agreements uh, we made it okay, for instance, through our working agreements to take a break when your energy is low. Uh, and we got clear on expectations with respect to start and, uh, and lunch breaks and all of those types of things. Um, and you see some of the working agreements on there that's from actually from uh, that sprint that we worked together on. Uh, and so if you fast forward to the end of this week, um, the team was able to deliver on multiple priorities including a list of resources for uh, CTC candidates that's still available on Scrum Alliance's website today. So here's what you can expect to take with you when you walk out of today's session. Uh, a deeper understanding of the why, how, and what of working agreements. A uh, recognition of when to use working agreements an increased ability to plan and facilitate working agreement sessions, uh, and two resources that you can use to create working agreements, including uh, a working agreements canvas and a checklist. All right. And so, you know, I, I think uh, we were already introduced a bit by Bob. So thank you, Bob, uh, for that. Uh, I guess I'll say a couple other things. Uh, so, um, Brock and I are uh, CCs and CTCs through Scrum Alliance, um, and our um, role, I guess, in organizations generally is that of Agile coach. Uh, however, we both have backgrounds in uh, project management. Uh, I'm a PMI member uh, and a PMP. And that's actually how we started our careers. And so one of the things that we've noticed is that uh, there is no agile organization uh, that is healthy and functioning that doesn't also include a really healthy blend of project management and principles as well. And so I think that's one of the um, really difficult challenges um, for organizations is, is to find how that works well. So um, 
a resource that Brock and I created um, to that end is called the Integrated Agile Manifesto. Not, uh, doesn't have to do with our talk today, but I, I thought that this audience in particular might find that interesting. So uh, shoot us a message uh, later on if, uh, if you do find that interesting. So the type of agile coaching that we do is a blend of relationship systems coaching and vertical development coaching. Um, it's that relationship systems part though that's gonna really uh, flavor our talk with you here today. Uh, and that's because uh, agile um, really uh, helps us to uh, have a lot of um, more interactions with one another, but it doesn't teach us how to build and navigate strong relationships. And so that's where the relationship systems part comes in. You'll sort of see that um, blended throughout the talk. Uh, as Bob mentioned, our company is Superheroes Academy. Uh, we're based out of Calgary, Canada, and we're available globally uh, to support you with um, uh, all of your agile training and coaching needs. Okay, so let's dive in. So, um, you know, maybe you um, have a team that you're already working with and feel like, actually, you know what, they're already working really well. And so you might be thinking, do I even really need to invest in working agreements at this point? Um, or should I just wait till I maybe get the next team or something like that? Uh, and what we would uh, suggest is the answer to that question is yes, you should always invest in them, invest in creating them because uh, working agreements can only make uh, your team better. They're not just for teams that might be experiencing problems. They're a necessary ingredient in making any good team great. And so if you happen to be on a virtual uh, or a hybrid team, then creating working agreements is even more important because you're gonna have that loss of visual information cues uh, that can just lead to many misunderstandings uh, between people, okay? And so you can consider working agreements for that reason as kind of like a preemptive conflict management strategy that is going to help your team ensure that the atmosphere that they create in advance is gonna hold when things maybe become a little bit more difficult later on. And so, you know, I'll just uh, have a bit of a disclaimer here that, you know, even though working agreements are gonna help keep conflict constructive uh, and helpful, um, they are not intended to eliminate all conflict because uh, conflict is actually the uh, birthplace of creativity and innovation. And it's how we leverage our diversity on teams, okay? Uh, and so now we have a really overwhelming uh, amount of research which shows that teams who invest in working agreements are going to outperform those who don't. Um, and so here's just some of the benefits uh, on the screen here that, uh, that we're aware of. So we know teams with working agreements have higher psychological safety because they define boundaries uh, around what is and is not acceptable behavior within the team. Uh, they increase dependability uh, between the team members because uh, if you think about it, we can't actually treat each other uh, the way we want to be treated or even meet each other's expectations until we make those things explicit um, in our conversations with one another. That's what working agreements do. Um, and then lastly, working agreements uh, are also necessary to providing teams with uh, the role clarity that teams are really often yearning for uh, when we first start to work with them. And one of the reasons is that um, company-wide job descriptions alone are never going to be enough to providing teams with role clarity. And so if you think about it, if you're uh, a scrum master on a couple different teams, the way you fill your role is gonna be completely different on each one of those teams based on what they need from you, okay? And so you might be more coach-like on one team. Uh, you might be working on a team that's really self-sufficient. And so uh, you, you maybe take a step back and spend your time you know, removing impediments out in the organization on their behalf. Uh, and then you might have another team that um, is really lacking those project management skills and you need to roll up your sleeve and uh, help them with that or maybe even coach them in those skills. And so that's all okay. Um, but it just sh shows to uh, provide an example that 
um, we all need to define how we're going to fill our roles on the specific context of each team and the people that we're working with. And that, so that's exactly what working agreements do. So Google did uh, a really large study into the effectiveness uh, of Teams, which is now really famous. You've probably all heard of it by now. It's called Project Aristotle. And what they found is that psychological safety, dependability, and role clarity are the top three most contributing factors uh, to high performance on Teams. So, um, so what are they? What are working agreements? Uh, and so um, they're also known as, uh, or you might also know them as explicit team norms or social contract. So all similar uh, ideas. Um, and we like to think of them as the rules of engagement uh, that detail what we're each going to give and receive uh, in a professional working relationship. So they're going to detail how we're gonna interact with one another, uh, what our expectations are of one another, and how we're going to handle problems uh, when they come up. So working agreements have existed really, you know, forever uh, since people have started to come together in communities. Uh, and it wasn't until the 17th century, though, that Thomas Hobbes first theorized about working agreements in his social contract theory, which stated that people are willing to give up some of their individual freedoms to create order in social settings. Uh, and so as an example of that, you know, uh, I might be on a scrum team that has core working hours between 11 p.m. and 2 p.m. every day. Uh, and maybe I see that as a bit of an infringement on my, you know, personal freedom to be able to decide when I come to work and when I stay home uh, and work and things like that. But, you know, maybe I also recognize that, um, you know, without some time that we're all in the office together, we're not going to be able to move forward on certain things. And so maybe I'm willing to accept that. So that would be uh, Hobbes' social contract theory in action. Uh, what's interesting is uh, in America, the U.S. Constitution uh, was actually a direct outcome uh, of Hobbes' philosophies. Uh, and so if we fast forward forward to the popularization of uh, Scrum and Agile in the 1990s and early 2000s. Um, we have now self-managed knowledge workers really everywhere tapped for the first time with deciding for themselves how they're going to work together. And so what they did uh, was they often codified those decisions into working agreements, which are at their essence, uh, a social contract that creates the basis for uh, order and a mutual understanding that's needed for those teams to thrive. And so we all participate uh, in working agreements uh, every day, whether we realize it or not. And that's because some of those working agreements uh, are unspoken and they're hidden, uh, but they guide our behavior nonetheless. And so, you know, you might have uh, um, helpful examples of unspoken working agreements. Uh, for instance, if we all maybe on our team just kind of know that we should check in on one another if it looks like we're having a bad day. Um, but they can also be unhelpful. <laughs> Excuse me. And so, uh, for example, if you've ever worked in a place where maybe you feel uncomfortable leaving the office before your boss does, then maybe there's a, a not so helpful working agreement that's maybe guiding behavior between people. <laughs> and so uh, the benefit then that we get from speaking about or uh, and, and actually writing down those working agreements is that we take those implicit working agreements and we move them into the light. We make them explicit, which now for the first time allows our team to inspect and adapt them to ensure that those working agreements are serving the team. And, and you know, this is, it's one of the most important points about working agreements. Um, and it's also why transparency is one of the three pillars of Scrum, because we actually can't inspect and adapt something until we can see it. Okay, so let's, let's chat about a few examples of situations where it uh, can be beneficial to have working agreements. Uh, and so you might choose to have working agreements with your Scrum team. Um, the quality of the relationships on your Scrum team can be a predictor of success. 
So it's always a good idea to have team working agreements. Uh, it's great if working agreements can be created when the team is formed, but that's not always possible. Uh, but don't worry, it's never too late uh, to create working agreements. And Ericon, I'm wondering if you can kind of um, scroll through so we, Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> uh, and so another situation where you might want uh, working agreements where it might be beneficial is between scrum teams and leaders. Uh, and so this is actually one of the most important working agreement sessions you can facilitate. In order for your scrum team to be self-managed, you need managers to delegate decision-making authority to the team. Um, what happens in most transformations, however, is you know a coach or scrum master uh, will get all the managers together uh, to talk about you know their new role and the value that they bring to the organization in that role. Um, then they'll get the scrum teams together in a separate meeting to talk about their responsibilities uh, and the logistics of how to work on a scrum team. And then they bring the leaders and scrum teams back together and it's fireworks. Managers have aligned in their group and the scrum teams have aligned in their group, um, but there's no alignment between the scrum teams and the leaders. Uh, and so a better approach we found is to bring managers and scrum teams together to talk about self-management and what that means to them, and then to create working agreements for alignment between the teams and leaders. Um, the next is coaching agreements. And you know we know from the 2020 Scrum Guide that Scrum Masters are coaches to their team and surrounding organization. Um, and did you know that working agreements between a coach and a client, um, also known as coaching agreements, are mandatory in any professional coaching relationship? So much so that if you don't have working agreements with the people you're coaching, then you're technically not their coach at all. Uh, and research has shown that the quality of working agreements may be more important than the particular techniques the coach uses when it comes to their client success, uh, which is really interesting. Um, you may also want to use uh, working agreements uh, as single use agreements for things like workshops and training sessions. Uh, this kind of working agreement is more informal uh, than a team working agreement. And it's captured probably on a temporary medium like a whiteboard or a flip chart online whiteboard or something. Uh, and these agreements really serve the purpose of enabling the success of the event um, and can be done really quickly at the start of the event with the whole group. Uh, and lastly, you might want to use working agreements in a one-on-one -on -one context. Uh, and so this is an agreement between colleagues. They're usually verbal and less formal, uh, including agreements such as how and when they'll support each other or communicate about work. A uh, one-on-one -on -one working agreement evolves as you work together and learn more about each other. Okay, so how to create working agreements. Um, and so, you know, a few guidelines and thoughts from our perspective uh, on what is necessary. Uh, something that happens lots of times as uh, scrum masters and coaches uh, and I know I did this when I started out as a scrum master. I would get everyone in a room together. We'd spend two hours, two and a half hours, hammering out all the working agreements and getting post-its up and the whole thing. Um, and then as soon as we started working, we realized, well, actually, we don't know so much about each other and we needed to adjust the working agreements anyway. Um, and so one of the things that we're suggesting is don't take that much time um, to get started with working agreements. Just spend 30 minutes, get some initial ideas together, uh, and then start working together and have kind of one main agreement, I suppose, that you're going to revisit those as you learn um, and do that as you uh, continue to work together. And one of the best ways to do that is as friction arises in the team. So, you know, when we have differences of opinions or there's something that you know, you're doing that annoys me or whatever it might be, uh, use that friction 
and start questioning you know what's happening there and use that to adapt or create working agreements um and so you know for facilitating a working agreement session uh, again we're we're suggesting like just take that 30 minutes uh, you're going to want everyone in that session who is expected to abide by the working agreements um, you can do this virtually or in person uh, definitely want to avoid the home team advantage and so that happens if half the people are virtual and half are in person, uh, whichever medium the facilitator is joining on, then that's the home team. And usually there's an advantage to being there as far as hearing all the communication and all the ideas or whatever it might be. Um, so to avoid that, have everyone in person or everyone virtual. Uh, and so that helps with that as well. You're gonna want a collaborative space probably a you know whiteboard or something like that so you can visualize the conversation as you're chatting about it and you know do this as soon as possible when the team is formed right away or as soon as possible after that and then kind of the last thing that we have to say on this is uh, this pro tip at the bottom but um, if you're on the scrum team and you want to contribute as a member of the team because you have opinions and things on how you want to work with everyone uh, get an outside outside facilitator to facilitate for you so that you can be fully involved as a team member and they can worry about the meeting okay so time for story number two um and so a few years back i found myself coaching an existing team at a client site uh, this team was struggling with their definition of done and being accountable to each other for their work um, the team created these eight working agreements that you see on the screen there. Luckily, we had an artist in the in the group, in the team that was able to make those for us. Uh, and this came out of a facilitated working agreement session um, that I had done. And so following that session, they took these eight working agreements, they posted them very visibly so that they would see them all the time, but also others, you know, outside the team also was seeing them. Uh, and then after a while, leaders in the organization noticed that team members were starting to hold each other accountable to these agreements that they came up with. And there was new energy uh, within the team due to the increased alignment that these working agreements created between everyone. Um, this particular team definitely outperformed other teams once they had aligned on the set of working agreements. So here's a resource uh, that we like to use when creating working agreements uh, called the Working Agreements Canvas for High Performing Teams. Uh, we call it that because each question on this canvas is based on the latest research into what it takes to foster growth uh, of high performing teams. So there's nine questions on this canvas. And if you can help your team to align on all of them, uh, then you'll know that you've set them up with the best chances for success. And so uh, if you'd like a copy of this canvas, you can uh, download it through the QR code um, on the screen. Uh, and here's how it works. Um, so you basically just sit down with your team um, and you document the questions to the answers that are on the canvas. Uh, each answer that you document is in itself a working agreement. You can answer uh, the questions in any order, and you don't need to fill out uh, the canvas in all in one sitting. So uh, you might document uh, some in one session, and then you might document others uh, as they emerge. That's all okay. So let's take a closer look at each one of uh, the questions on the canvas here. Uh, the first one is atmosphere. So how will we build an atmosphere of cooperation, support, and encouragement? So, you know, a, a lot has been said about how we spend oftentimes more time at work with our coworkers than we do with our families. So what do we want it to be like when we're together? How will we make decisions? So, um, you know, this can be anything, um, but one thing that we really encourage you to think about is uh, that in the agile uh, and agile teams specifically, um, this idea that everything needs to be decided with everybody at the table all the time 
um, or deciding through consensus uh, is actually something that's really slow and you can probably do better than that when it comes to working agreements. So how can you trust each other the way that your organization has trusted you uh, to self-manage um, so that you can continue to uh, move forward with the decisions you make? How will we create the safety required for team members to bring their whole selves to work and freely share their ideas? So this one uh, is squarely focused on that idea of psychological safety. And you know there isn't really an order to, uh, to any of these, uh, except for this one. This one is in the middle and at the top uh, because it's uh, one of those ones that uh, has been shown uh, to be most influential in terms of uh, our working environment and creating high performance. How will the world be different? as a result of our success. So, so important uh, to your ability to succeed as a team uh, um, for you to know how the work you're doing um, matters and you know, how it aligns with you know, other goals that might be happening in your organization. What is each person's role and what are they responsible for? So again, that one speaks directly to that idea of role clarity that we talked about. How and when will we provide each other with feedback? Um, so, uh, you know, lots of different ways you can do this. Uh, when you ask teams uh, this question, oftentimes you'll get people, especially in professional environments, that just say, you know, I just want feedback really direct. Just give it to me straight as soon as you have it. Um, but the truth is that very few people are actually capable of accessing feedback in a useful way when we give it to them that way, especially when you give them that kind of feedback in front of their peers. And so a better working agreement that we like to encourage teams to maybe think about is, hey, when you need to give each other feedback, pull each other aside one-on-one -on -one and give it to them privately. And then when you wanna give each other praise, well, then you do it in front of the group so that people get credit for their work. So feedback privately, praise publicly. Just one way to do it. How will we bring our diversity to bear through genuine constructive conflict and lively debate? So this question has a couple parts to it. Um, one part that you probably picked up on is we want, when, when we have conflict, we wanna make sure it's constructive, okay? So how are we gonna do that um, so that we maintain that safe environment? The other part to this question you'll notice is that it, it's geared towards making sure conflict happens at all. Because if you're one of those teams that has no conflict, if you have uh, what we call artificial harmony on your team, then um, they're generally stuck and you're in a place where you can't move to high performance. Uh, and so um, if that happens to be your team and you're a leader on that team, your job might actually be to ask a question like this and even stir the pot a little, start some fights uh, so that they can move through that storming phase into the more, more high performing phases that, uh, that will happen later on. How will we grow into T-shaped team members building resiliency around specific skill sets? This uh, particular question is aimed at uh, reducing risk on your project that has to do with knowledge silos. So we've seen teams um, attack this challenge in all sorts of ways. Um, really common to do like lunch and learn so that everybody teaches everybody else what their skills are. Uh, in practice though, what we found is those types of interventions very rarely actually transfer skills so that people can do each other's jobs. The only thing that works is apprenticeship models. So pairing on tasks. So if there's a task or a technology or something that only one person on your team knows how to do, um, you might have a working agreement where we are going to agree that anytime we get a task in that area, um, you are going to pair with somebody else. Uh, and if you can do that, you'll find that very quickly knowledge silos will evaporate within your group. What else is important in how we work together? So this is just one of our favorite uh, coaching questions, really open-ended and it can uh, create space to allow whatever needs to emerge uh, to emerge in the conversation. 
you might even start a conversation uh, on this canvas with this question and the team can tell you what they need to align on. So uh, we're not going to spend too much time here, but here's some examples of working agreements you might find in each section. I did mention a few as we took you through uh, the canvas, uh, and we'll make the slides available after the session. So uh, there's lots of different ways that uh, you might facilitate a really great working agreement session. Uh, and uh, there's merit to all of the different styles out there. So there's no one way to skin this cat, I'll say. Um, however, here are seven steps that we found useful uh, in our approach over the years. And maybe you'll find something useful uh, for yourself in there too. So step number one is just to make sure you have a strategy. Okay, so spend some time thinking about um, how you're going to run this session. And I'm generally going to hit couple um, points uh, while I'm creating my strategy. So the first one is the level of formality that's needed uh, for this session. Um, is this just going to be like a quick informal conversation where we align on a couple of things and we're done? Or does this need to be a more formal workshop uh, and we're going to write our working agreements down somewhere? Maybe we're even going to sign those working agreements like a contract. So, you know, if this is for your team, and you're going to be uh, with that team for at least the foreseeable future, we definitely recommend that you take uh, the more formal end of that spectrum, okay? Uh, and then we're gonna prepare an agenda. Uh, and so uh, I might simply plan to ask all of those questions in the canvas that I just showed you, uh, or I might pick a subset of them based on what I know the team needs or maybe what they're struggling with. So. I will say that even though we select some questions in advance, we're always going to be flexible during the session uh, and stay responsive to the team's needs and whatever shows up. And so um, this idea of preparing an agenda in advance and then, and then executing it, that's where we're going to be leveraging our facilitation skills. Uh, and then this other idea of staying flexible and dancing in the moment uh, and, and, you know, maybe using our intuition to help guide us in terms of what question needs to happen next. That's where I'm going to be leveraging my coaching skills. And we really think that you need both of those facilitation and coaching to be able to do a session like this really well. Um, the second step is going to be to create buy-in. Now, your working agreement session uh, is highly unlikely to be successful if the team doesn't know why they're doing it and they haven't bought into the process. Okay, and so we're always going to start off by explaining uh, a couple things, what the team is going to be doing, why they're doing it, and what they're going to get out of the session. And then we're going to ask for permission to actually facilitate the session. And so, for instance, uh, I might say something like, you know, good morning team. In this session, you're going to be creating working agreements. We're doing this activity because it's going to make you a better team. And the research is clear that teams who invest in creating working agreements are going to outperform those who don't. The agenda for today is we're going to use this working agreements canvas, which uh, was created based on research in terms of what it takes to create high performing teams. So uh, do I have your permission to facilitate this con conversation today? Uh, and then I'll create some space and I'll deal with whatever emerges from that question. If somebody says, no, I don't wanna do this, then great, they don't have to do it. Uh, and then we'll, we'll move on from there. Okay, step number three is to visualize the conversation. And so, you know, now it's time to actually dive in and start creating the working agreements. And so, as I ask each question, um, I'm going to be taking notes on a flip chart or uh, a virtual collaboration tool like Miro or Mural or something like that, um, so that I can visualize the conversation. And um, the reason we do this is because when two people are talking about a problem, that problem actually exists spatially in between the two of them. Uh, but when we can uh, take that problem and we can write it somewhere visual, like let's say out on a wall somewhere, 
um, we actually move the problem from between them to out in front and it forces them into a new configuration where the team has to stand side by side and work on a problem that's external to them together, okay? And so the positioning is really intentional. And uh, you know, if you try it, you'll notice that it causes a really powerful shift in the energy in the room. And, and what I find is really interesting is even though you know there's some of the physical moving around and things that happens when you're in person, it's actually just as effective uh, when you do it uh, in virtual settings as well. So give it a shot. Uh, step number four is to avoid groupthink. And so um, for many facilitators, uh, the default approach is going to be to uh, ask each person on the team to brainstorm ideas on sticky notes um, for each question that's asked, and then use some type of voting mechanism like dot voting uh, to determine the most important ideas and then pick those and you move on. Okay, so people have seen that before, brainstorm and then just vote. Okay, so don't do that. Okay, um, that is a um, th that approach is lacking. Um, and it's very similar to the problem with consensus that we described earlier when we talked about making decisions. And so, um, you know, a couple things I'll say about that is first, hearing from everybody on every topic is going to take longer than you have in a session like this. And second, using stickies and then voting is a recipe for group think, which leads to people sharing similar ideas and marginalizing different opinions uh, because people feel social pressure to side with the majority, okay? And so as an alternative strategy, try hearing every opinion instead of hearing from every person, okay? And I'll say that again, try hearing every opinion instead of hearing from every person. And so you can do that in a couple ways. Um, one is you might just ask what perspectives haven't we heard yet? Or you might ask a question like, okay, who has a different opinion on this? If there are six people on your team and five of them think the same way, I'm not gonna let all five people um, repeat the same idea and hammer on more and more social pressure, um, causing this you know, one poor person in the corner with the only original idea in the room uh, to not want to share their idea. Okay, we'll hear from the first person and then we'll say who has a different idea. And so by doing that, you can very quickly get all of the different proposals out on the table. And even though everybody in the room maybe hasn't physically spoken, everybody will have felt heard and then you'll be able to move on. Uh, session number five is to capture the deeper meaning. So as we're uh, keeping notes during the session, it's not important or actually even helpful to capture absolutely everything that's said because this is just going to dilute the team's working agreements with too many ideas and make them too difficult to remember. So instead, we're just going to let the conversation deepen and we're going to capture only those major points of alignment as they arise. Um, and specifically, what I'm going to be um, probing for is asking for what concrete observable um, behaviors. Um, you know, can you associate with, you know, whatever working agreement that you're talking about? Okay, number six is to check for alignment. And so every so often and definitely at the end, I'm just gonna ask a question like, how close is what we have written down so far being good enough to get started? Okay, and so it's kind of like step number two where we create buy-in, but we're doing it periodically throughout the session. We're just making sure we don't lose anyone. Uh, and then lastly, we're gonna build in uh, accountability um, by just asking uh, some specific questions um, such as, you know, how can you keep each other accountable to these working agreements so that I don't have to police you, for instance? And, you know, what can you do to keep these agreements visible uh, and that type of thing. Okay. So it's time for an activity. We're gonna use breakouts now. Don't leave. It's only gonna be a few minutes. Everyone back, so welcome back. Um, and maybe just, I'd like to hear from, let's say two groups. Someone can just, uh, you know, 
call something out. Um, but what are you learning about working agreements uh, through this activity? Hey, hey, Brock, uh, it's Wayne. I, I work with Angela and um, uh, Shirley and Miriam, and uh, it was nice to get to know them quickly. I think we took on safety. A couple points that we brought up were just, you know, to always be nice and bring our whole selves and you don't have to be perfect. Oh, good. Yeah, I like that last one. Uh, sometimes we're always too concerned about everything being right. So that's good. Thanks, Wayne. Yeah, and someone else? This is Larry. Uh, our little group decided to start at the bottom of the canvas just because we thought other people might be starting at the top. And just one thing that was kind of interesting because we were looking at feedback and we put agile tools to work and thought that a daily stand up, the scrum meeting would be a good way to have regular scheduled structured feedback so we could get a lot of information transmitted in a short period of time. Great, yeah, thanks Larry. Okay, so, um, you have that, you've had some experience with it. Um, and so that's one of the tools that you can take with you. Um, we've got a few, uh, okay. One question, I think Demetrius had a question and then we're going to move on. We have a, just a few more things to say about working agreements after this. Yeah, I, I won't, uh, I won't go have this go too long, but anyway, in our group, um, and I won't say it was all in our group, but this is typically what exactly what happens when we have a, have a breakout, uh, at least in my experience is that we don't speak up and we just sit there and it's try, trying to get people motivated to even just participate. <laughs> so that is that is real. I mean, that, that is so real. It was so it was very typical what would happen. So I just wanted to call that out because mm -hmm. other teams may experience the same thing and just know that that's natural. <laughs> it's not uh, that's a real thing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that. And um, it's the type of thing maybe not you know in this session exactly but it's the type of thing where working agreements could help with that as well um and so that's a kind of an interesting thought and connection so thanks demetrius for that okay so we're going to move forward a few more things to say about working agreements uh, and then we're going to allow some time for questions um, and so there's a few principles that i want to go over with you um, and first off uh you know working agreements they require regular maintenance, just like cars, in order for them to run well. Uh, and so ideally, you know, working agreements are seamlessly integrated into your everyday team events and interactions. Uh, and after you've made a working agreement, uh, one thing you want to make sure you do is update them during, you know, your kickoffs or new, you know, initiatives that you have going on or when team members are maybe added or removed. Um, and maybe, you know, every respect, retrospective, just have a quick look at them to see if anything needs to change. Um, and to maintain the value of your working agreements, um, there's four key principles that uh, we want you to keep in mind here. Uh, and so we'll go to the next slide there. And principle number one uh, is all about making them visible. Uh, and in my experience as an Agile coach, one of the most uh, impactful things you can do is make something visible. You know, a problem maybe if you're running into something or noticing something in a team, uh, but especially working agreements. And so if they can't be remembered, they can't be followed. So you want to post these visibly, um, like the, kind of in the second story I told, whether that's a physical location or virtual. Um, and, you know, you want to kind of you know, make sure you have a good balance between accessibility and visibility of the working agreements, but also confidentiality if there's things that need to stay within the team. Okay. Uh, so that's principle one. Principle two, uh, we've mentioned uh, briefly, but to call out the friction that uh, emerges as you work together. Uh, and so as a scrum master or coach, when you notice friction in the team, I uh, call it out and ask, hey, is there a working agreement that informs this situation? And if the answer is no, well, then ask the team, well, what do you want to do about this situation? And then whatever that decision is, uh, put it in the working agreement so that you have it for next time. Principle three, you want to make them self-reinforcing. Uh, and so, you know, sometimes once working agreements are created, Scrum Masters become the working agreements police. 
and keep each everyone accountable to the working agreements. So you want to avoid that stance because it's going to negatively impact uh, relationships within your Scrum team and with your teammates. Um, it also makes it difficult to do all your other jobs. Uh, Scrum masters have a lot to do. There's a lot they're accountable for. And so uh, you really don't have time to be doing that. It's not your job to enforce working agreements, but more so to enable them. Uh, and so if you notice that you're falling into you know, a policing role uh, around the working agreements, try a few different strategies uh, such as these. Um, you may want to sit up, set up systems or processes so working agreements can be adhered, adhered to with no effort. Um, and so this is a win-win, you know, because it gets you out of the role of police officer, but agreements also get followed. Uh, and so, you know, a simple one, for example, is if you have a working agreement that uh, whenever, you know, code is checked in to the repository, it has to be reviewed uh, by a peer. And so you might just add, you know, a field to your check-in form that says reviewed by and make it a mandatory field. Uh, and so then that way it's kind of automatically enforced, okay? Um, you may also wanna ask the team, you know, how and when do you wanna keep each other accountable? Uh, and then they can decide for themselves how they want to do that. Uh, and then you also wanna create positive moments. So instead of pointing out when the team is maybe doing things wrong, catch them doing things right, uh, and then let them know how well they're doing. Uh, and then principle four is to update working agreements often. Uh, and so there's, you know, really no bad time to create or update working agreements. So when you form a new team, you know, create a set of working agreements. Um, every day when the team is working together, they'll see these working agreements that you've posted visibly to remind them of what their working agreements are. Uh, maybe every sprint, you know, retrospective action items become codified in your working agreements. Uh, or maybe when people, you know, join or leave the team, you may want to facilitate a session to update existing working agreements or maybe create new ones. Um, and, you know, maybe whenever the team starts a new initiative or six months after creating working agreements, whichever is shorter. Um, and so you wouldn't want to go too long past, say, a few months without having reviewed and updated those. Okay, so at the start, I promised you two resources uh, when I was talking about the session outcomes. So you have the working agreements canvas and you've worked with that already. So this is the second resource. Um, and so please go ahead and you know scan the QR code to get that. Uh, and what this is, is the working agreements checklist. Uh, and so it sums up you know, all of the ideas that we kind of talked about today that'll help you in planning your next working agreement session. Um, and, you know, if you don't get the QR code right away or anything like that, um, you know, we're, we got the recording and we're happy to provide uh, the slides as well. So you can get it that way. Okay, and so the other thing we want to mention is that uh, if you enjoyed the content of this talk, uh, we actually turned it into a uh, free online course uh, that you can get from scrumalliance.org if you happen to be a Scrum Alliance member. Uh, and so that course is called Working Agreements That Work. And there's actually a part two uh, advanced course that's also free called Working Agreements That Evolve uh, that you might be interested in there as well. Uh, and so if you head over to the uh, learning journey section of the Scrum Alliance page, um, you'll find those two courses, but also a whole bunch of uh, um, uh, additional courses that have just recently been added uh, by community contributors. Uh, and so really cool new resource uh, that's available. So um, that's all we had planned uh, for you today. Uh, we appreciate you all taking the time to uh, join us. Uh, and then uh, we will take questions in a moment, but before we do, um, I'd be really interested in hearing, uh, just by way of wrap up, maybe from two or three people, uh, what did you find most helpful in our talk today? I love the canvas, uh, nice approach to kind of have the conversation. 
I certainly work in teams without formal agreements, and I think it's a good way to uh, initiate it. Uh, conversations. Thanks, Dan. Erkin and Brock, one of the one of the things that was very interesting is is a lot of times it's the elephant in the room. You have your group together, and and they're they're afraid to sort of wrestle with some of the some of the things that your uh, canvas pointed out. That if you don't ask them or you don't um, um, make sure the group's at least thinking about it, then what's going to happen is you're going to hit a conflict or hit something where now they don't respond with respect or with integrity or whatever, and now you're realizing it's because you didn't have that working agreement in place. So this is great. Thanks, Colin. It's Larry. One thing that I liked was your commentary on consensus and that that is not always the best way to go about making a decision. So it was nice to hear that reinforced. Awesome. Yeah. Usually it's not. Um, great. Okay. Well, uh, you know, that, that concludes uh, the content that we had for you. Um, here is a, a slide on resources. If you want to take a screenshot of that or something, uh, there's additional um, reading and things you can do. And I'm sure uh, John and Bob, you'll make the slides available so people can click the links and things. Um, but we do, uh, if anybody needs to go, uh, since it's the end of the hour, thank you for your time. Uh, and then if anybody wanted to stick around and chat about anything or ask questions about the presentation, uh, Brock and I will stick around for a few minutes as well. Okay, there, there's one question out there from uh, Kevin O'Brien. Can we squeeze that in quickly? Yeah, let's do it. All right, Kevin, you want to ask that yourself? Yeah, it's right there in the chat. Uh, I was wondering if you have had prior experiences uh, where you'll get uh, people who are over dominant on a team. I'm working with the team right now, and there's what we call strong personalities, and they're often very impatient and, you know, hurry, 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 and they tend to usurp everybody else's role and over dominate and they are high you know executive director has been there is their role and um this is not a scrum team just if i could background it is you know a project team uh doing clinical research uh trials and uh that is you know what we're finding that there are some people who you know kind of just bulldoze if you will and so i was just wondering if you had any prior experiences or any any um tips and tricks you know how to rein someone like that in i mean showing them the canvas it seems like uh that would work but i wanted to see if you you know had any other advice that's actually going sure, on right here mike you're experiencing that too yep yeah. So yeah, really common thing. And I think one of the reasons why it's so common is because uh, your system will always cast somebody into the loud, into the role of the dominant loudest person. Um, if you have a group of 10 people and there's two people that are like super domineering, if you actually get rid of those people, your system will cast two new people into the role of the people who do all the talking in the meeting. So um, you will need to find a way to manage that as facilitators. Um, so the first uh, tip I have, I guess, is you mentioned that this person had a power over situation with the other people in the room. So anytime you're aware of something like that, um, just design around it explicitly in your working agreement session. So one of the questions you might plan to ask is, okay, people, there is a power dynamic at play where this person's a director or whatever. Uh, and so I just want to call that ex out explicitly. How do you want to be with that? And then the team can design. And when you ask that question, they'll um, probably come up with something that's really healthy. Um, the other thing you can do is when you're facilitating, um, kind of like how I mentioned um, your role is to hear from every opinion, not from every person. You can use some of those questions that I gave you, such as, um, okay, we, we heard an opinion. Who has a different opinion? And that will immediately cause the person who's domineering to wait and, and hear for something that he hasn't said yet. Um, another thing, another question that we like to ask is, 
uh, who haven't we heard from yet? Or, you know, let's say you talk about one section in the canvas and then you're about to move to the next. You might say, okay, now for this next question, let's start with someone who hasn't spoken yet today. So that's, that's how we would facilitate it. But I totally get that some people are like super domineering and, uh, you know, you might need a little bit more help than that. Um, Brock, do you, do you have any thoughts as well? Yeah. The, for, for when you're facilitating, so in the sessions or whatnot, um, might not be able to see this, but the best uh, resource that I found is the facilitator's guide to participatory decision making. Uh, and I'll just post the link in the chat for that for everybody. Um, so this book by Sam Keener uh, has, you know, some really useful things on uh, dealing with, uh, you know, maybe conflict that might be happening or challenges that you have within a uh, session that you're facilitating. Uh, and so he does address uh, the dominant personality and those types of things. What I really love about it is he has a table uh, that, or however he's formatted it, that says, you know, okay, you're facilitating, you got a dominant personality. Uh, here's what we usually do is this thing, but here's why that doesn't work. And here's why you should do this other thing. Uh, and so I find that really helpful. Um, so perhaps you will as well. Okay. Uh, we're, we're just past the hour. So uh, Bob Phillips uh, has a special announcement. Bob, it's you. Okay. 